Thank you, Father. Lift your hands toward heaven and give him praise. Honor the Lord, bless his holy name. Give him praise, give him glory. Give him praise, give him glory. Thank you, Father. We bless your name. We magnify your name. We honor you, precious Redeemer. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your patience with us, Father. Thank you for the help of your spirit, the enablement that comes by your word. Thank you for the transformations from glory to glory. Thank you for the transfigurations. Father, we bless you for access, access to your secrets, access to your realm, access to your light. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to conform even as we are instructed by your spirit. And thank you for empowerment, Father. You are sending us from place to place to represent you and to establish your government. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's by the spirit of the living God. And so tonight, even as we congregate, Lord, we say, let your name alone be glorified. And we say, Lord, have your way in our midst. In Jesus' precious name. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Hmm. I release the sound of the heavens, the sound of creation. I release the sound of the heavens, the sound of creation. Yahweh is here. We cry holy, holy, holy unto Yeshua. Shekinah is here. We cry holy, holy, holy unto Yeshua. Yahweh is here. Yahweh, Yahweh, hey, 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 hey. Yahweh, Yahweh, hey, 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 hey. Yahweh, Yahweh. Glory to God. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. We are pressed for time. Glory to God. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. How many of you are excited to be in God's presence? Glory to God. You better be excited. Because this is what you will do forever and ever. <laughs> you better learn to love the presence of God. Because that's the biggest reward of heaven. That's what we will do. That's where we will be forever and ever. So if you don't love the presence of God, then you may just be on your way to Hades. Because <laughs> in eternity, that will be the only place that is not dominated by the presence of God. So if you don't love God's presence, perhaps you love somewhere else. <laughs> but it's not your portion. I know these are lovers of God's presence. Do I have a witness in the house? Come on! <laughs> you know, there are people who come to God's presence. They are looking at time. They, are, they can't sit in one place. They want to go out, distract themselves a bit. You may just be preparing yourself for hell. You have to learn to love the presence of God because this is your, your abode for all eternity. But glory to God, we don't just love God's presence, we carry God's presence. We carry God's presence. You know, we are the ark of the New Testament. We carry the presence. We carry God's presence. Wherever we go to, 
God shows up. That's who we are. Glory to God. In Jesus' name. I don't want to digress. We are on a series. And last week, Tuesday, we looked at a very sensitive part of our foundations in Christ. Can we begin from Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 1 again? You know, these things, they look very simple and sometimes unimportant. But the quality of your Christian life is dependent on the degree to which you master these things. If these things are wrong in your life, every other thing will be wrong. We thank God for the apostles of old for yielding themselves so much to God and for allowing the Spirit of God to carry them in the way and manner in which he was able to carry them based on their compliance and yieldedness. Thank God for these wonderful brothers of ours that were at the foundation who established the counsel of God upon which we are building. From the prophets of old to the apostles of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of our faith. Imagine if they got it wrong. Sometimes when I consider the precision in their walk with God, I keep asking God for mercy. The precision that God could entrust this man to establish a foundation that will last for all eternity. You know, Peter was speaking in 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 20. He said, knowing this first, in case you don't know, knowing this first, he said, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. In verse 21, he said, prophecy, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So these guys were able to subdue and submit their will to God. So much so that everything they did was in accordance to God's order and to God's standard. He said, but holy men. He didn't say anointed men. He said holy men. Men who are obsessed about God, who are completely submitted to God, and who are saturated by the spirit of god men in whom god has absolute authority and right of way he said holy men of god speak as they were moved by the spirit of god every word they spoke was exact with highest level precision you wonder the mistakes we make in one day Amazing. Emmanuel, saturate my heart, cause an overflow. Oh, Emmanuel, saturate my heart, cause an overflow. Oh, Emmanuel, saturate, saturate my heart. Cause an overflow. Oh, Emmanuel. The Bible said, Holy men spake as they were carried. So they came to a level of precision where there was no error. And so the things they uttered cannot be edited. The things they uttered cannot be improved upon. And the things they uttered was correct anywhere you take it to in all of the universes of God you could present it before the father and it had 100% accuracy so they proved to us that the zenith of our Christian experience is perfection they showed us that it was possible for us to attain perfection in this body you know in our generation we are even afraid to mention it in fact, everything we speak about perfection today is a measure of character development. 
we cannot dare imagine that perfection is a possibility but peter is revealing to us here that the things they modeled met the highest standard of god and it could match anywhere and any standard in any realm because they were so yielded to god their will was suspended and the holy ghost carried them as he willed so they were one with the spirit this is the same emphasis paul brought us in hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1 because when paul came to mentor the church he was letting them understand that the purpose the goal the emphasis was to attain perfection in christ jesus he said therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on to perfection the same order that peter spoke about let us go on to hope you know that these guys understood this thing and they lived it in first corinthians chapter 11 from verse 1 paul was speaking he said be ye followers of me as i am the follower of christ i have modeled christ to a perfection a perfect standard that if you follow me you can't miss christ's standard that is the level of perfection these guys modeled and paul is saying one of the major responsibility of a minister is first of all to press on to perfection and then to also mentor his followers to attain that level of perfection so he said i am following christ perfectly i want you to also follow me as i follow christ because when you see me you see him john reiterated the same emphasis in first john 4 17 he said as he is he said so are we in this world not in heaven as he is so are we in this world so paul is telling us that there is no glory in our christian experience if we cannot mature to a point where we reveal jesus christ so much so that when you encounter us it's as good as though you have encountered christ and that was how christ walked the face of the earth he said if you have seen me he said you have seen the father and so our daily pursuit should be perfection in christ jesus but you see for you to attain that level of perfection he said there are things that must form your foundation now when paul was teaching the church in ephesus he gave us the summary of the purpose of the fivefold ministry in ephesians 4 from verse 11 he said to some he gave to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers and then he went further he said for the perfecting of the saints so we are pressing on to perfection and our job is also to perfect the saints the word used here for perfecting is the word for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry and then he went to verse 13 he started showing us the six the seven levels of perfection the seven levels of perfection not just maturity but perfection number one he said in verse 13 quickly for the unity of the saints he says so a man who begins to journey in the direction of perfection his first goal is to come to unity that is a level you get to where you don't see another brother or sister in church just as a church member you see that person as your brother and as your sister and above that you also see that person as a part of a body that you belong to just the way your hand cannot rebel against the other the way your eyes cannot look at your nose as different he said when we come to the unity of the faith we begin to see ourselves so much as one that we now discover that we are one body he said if a man is growing into perfection there is something that happens to his perception his sight that he no longer sees another christian as a different entity 
now this is not talking about giftings and power this is talking about something much more than giftings and power this is talking oneness in Christ Jesus and so the first level of maturity and the first level of perfection is your ability to see the next believer as a part of you the same way your eyes your nose your ears are different parts of the same body you see the reason you can gossip somebody attack somebody is because you have not grown to a level of seeing them as part of you no matter what happens to your hand you won't cut it off if they are to cut off your hand you will weep and weep and weep this is why you have no right to correct anybody if it's not in love because you have not seen him as a part of you you still think we are rivals coming from different places to contend for knowledge and you think it's a debate of who knows more even if your hand is wrong your left hand won't cut it out your left hand will never rebel against your right hand because he sees both of it of them as one so paul is saying the first level of perfection and maturity is to come to the unity of the faith you know how he described it hmm. that's not my teaching he said we have one lord we have one baptism everything is one we share we share everything the same way every part of your body is connected to the central nervous system he said that is how we are if your journey is unto perfection something must happen to your understanding and you will see like that and then he went to the second part he said we will come to the knowledge of the son of god so you begin to know jesus by experience jesus for you is no longer a component of a theological teaching jesus becomes a person that you have a real experiential relationship with the same way first john put it in first john chapter one from verse one he said that which was from the beginning which we heard of which we looked upon but our hands have now handled that's the knowledge of the son of god experiential relationship with god so he said you migrate from seeing all of us as one to coming into an experiential relationship with jesus and then he went further keep it on verse 13. i'm trying to show you what paul the way the apostles teach because hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 to 3 is supposed to come before ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 16. if you understand hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1 to 3 then you migrate to ephesians chapter 6 from verse 11 to verse 16. because the reason you get the foundation is to come into perfection but you see if you are still doing dead works you can't see another person as one because what dead works is doing is that it makes you think it's competition so you are doing something to gratify the flesh and to appear as though you are superior to others and if dead works is at work in you you can't see your brother as one you see the way the apostle no wonder they call he called himself a wise master builder he said from the knowledge of the son of god you now come on to a perfect man this is maturity this is where we stop our teaching perfect man here speaks of embodying the character of christ that is galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 where you can model and embody the character or the fruits of the spirit you speak about patience you speak about long suffering you speak about kindness so this thing is a definite progression in fact when you have modeled the fruit of the spirit the proof the most potent proof is how you use your tongue because your tongue is your greatest trigger everybody strikes with the tongue and so james chapter 3 verse 2 said show me a perfect man he said it is one who has rule over his tongue if a man cannot control his tongue he doesn't have the fruits of the spirit and this is the third level of perfection so you begin from the unity of the faith where you see us as one body then you come to the experiential knowledge of christ then you come into a place where you have embodied the fruit of the spirit in you is patience in you is kindness in you is mercy in you is long suffering and the proof is the meekness and brokenness 
in your communication and he didn't stop there the journey is much more go to verse 14 he said unto the okay verse 13 unto the fullness of the measure of the stature of christ this speaks about the principles of jesus christ so now that you have embodied the character of jesus you don't just do things haphazardly you do things the god way because there are many people who don't understand the way god does things that's why you hear teachings like the teachings on honor you hear teachings on so many things on giving you now begin to practice the ways of god there are many things you would have loved to do your own way but you no longer have the liberty to do things the way you want you do it the god way that's the fourth level where you embody the principles of christ how do you handle your money how do you handle your relationships how do you handle crisis of life all of those will no longer be as you feel or deem fit is as the bible instructs that you should be done for example the bible said if you have an ought if your brother has an ought against you it says leave your offering on the altar that means relationship is superior to giving you cannot have an issue with your brother and you say you are a mighty giver and then you are happy that you gave a seed of 10 million he said that seed is it doesn't come before relationship with brother. that's the principle of christ so you forget about the giving first and make peace with your brother and he said in case you want to make peace with your brother and it's not working he said get two or three persons to go and speak to him he said if you get two or three persons to speak to him and he still doesn't repent he said now tell the church let the church go to him if the church goes to him and he doesn't repent then let him be but see our generation today if i have a problem with you before i ever confront you i have gossiped you to a thousand people you see where the immaturity is because i want to pull you down discredit you and make sure you amount to nothing that's what will give me joy but the god way is different i will confront you speak to you about the matter if you don't see it right or we don't make it up we get two other brothers who are strong in the faith to come and mediate if that doesn't work we get the church to come and mediate that is the god way but today we are talking mysteries manifesting power but we don't know the principles of christ so we have not grown to the fullness of the measure of the stature of christ and he didn't stop there he now went to verse 14 are you seeing the journey to perfection in verse 14 it says henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine now you see that all of these things you have been practicing from number one to four is experiential from unity to knowledge of the son of god to character of the spirit to principles of christ it's possible that as you are doing this somebody can come to you and say you are not wise you are being foolish and then they start bringing strange doctrine he said you cannot afford not to be grounded in doctrine that means what you are doing you must be able to trace it to the word of god you are not doing it because you have a temperament you are not doing it because you are coerced you are not doing it because you are immobilized or timid if i choose to be humble i'm not humble because i have the temperament of a humble person if i choose to be humble i'm not humble because i don't have means if i choose to be humble i'm not humble because i'm being intimidated i am humble because i have an understanding doctrinally that that is the disposition of a believer so there's no way you can talk me out of it if i choose to give for kingdom advancement you can't coerce me to give you can't boost my ego to give neither can you discourage me from giving because that action you see me practicing is a product of a thorough and deep understanding of the word of god but you see when people are not mature they take actions based on impulses and so when they come for a service and they preach on giving they empty their money the next five years they are not giving because they don't have a deep revelation and they can give in that service as they walked out somebody heard what they gave and said what even you too they have been washed you and immediately the person starts regretting why he gave that money because he's not doing it based on revelation 
you find people spend their time in prayer as they are praying somebody else comes and tells them forget this prayer thing oh god relax it's not prayer walk with your hand they stop prayer they start walking tomorrow they are walking somebody else comes to them and say you will walk and kill yourself oh, better go and pray they leave work and go to the altar because they are not grounded if they understand doctrine they will know the place of balance because on one hand you have to walk on another hand you have to trust the lord because there's no spirit that blesses a man who has no works but when there is no doctrine he said you are children tossed to and fro so the reason a man will remain in the path of perfection is because there is a groundedness in doctrine and he didn't stop there he went further he now entered a heavier matter verse 15 he said but speaking now the real matter has come out speaking the truth in love that's the sixth level of perfection when love becomes your operating system know that you are beginning to approach christ because the nature of christ is love the bible said in first john 4 8 he said god is love love is the summary and the totality of the nature of god now when you start journeying with god you will discover that your journey will begin from knowledge into power into love love is the highest level of our operation on earth there are many persons who assume that the highest level of spiritual operation is knowledge paul said i can speak all mysteries i know all mysteries and i can speak with the tongues of angels he said if i have not love i am but a clanging simba so the lowest level of our spiritual engagement is access to spiritual knowledge you may have mysteries but if your mysteries does not translate to power the devil will make a mess of you have you seen people that talk all the mystery on finances yet they are poor have you seen people that talk all the mystery on power yet there is no demonstration of power have you seen people that talk all the mysteries in the scripture but when you look at their lives there is no proof because from knowledge you are supposed to get into power the proof that you know is that you have power they say i'm not ashamed of the gospel of christ it is the power of God unto salvation so our journey is knowledge then power but when you come into power and you remain there the devil can use you as a slave the devil can use you as a servant and so when you come into power you move from power to love and so when Paul was teaching us about the journey of perfection he said the sixth level of perfection is when you come into love and this love is not just something you claim to have it is revealed by your action he said when you speak what we perceive from your speaking should be love and it doesn't even end with just speaking it should be communicated through your action how can you say you are a giver and there is a poor man in your house who has nothing yes you are the highest partner in church you are a hypocrite you are a religious man if you have a heart for giving before you become the highest partner in church you should have noticed that lazarus at your gate because if your heart does not move towards that lazarus at your gate what you are doing in your church is religion i saw a man i was with watching something with my wife recently and a man almost killed his own child why because the child did something that affected his reputation in church he's a dicky it's not about character it's not about pleasing christ it's about his ego I'm a deacon in church. How can this person do this kind of thing? Ha! I've been demoted from my office of a deacon. There's no forgiveness. There's no love of God. There's no teaching the truth in love. There's no correcting the child. It doesn't even matter whether the child is destroyed. So long as his deacon ship is preserved. Religion in Africa. Paul said, when you start coming to perfection, you will get to a place where love will imprison you you will become a prisoner of the love of god and anything you do your greatest motivation will be the love of god that's what informs every action of god there's no action god takes that is not motivated by love he said for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son every action god takes is motivated by love and a man cannot function in love and be in error the bible said there is no law against love there is no law against love when love is in motion 
the law is kept in fact the fulfillment of the law is the ability to manifest love because when love shows up the law is, is put away because if you walk in love you will keep the law and then finally paul began to talk about perfection he said that we may grow up into him this is where perfection comes in when we come into love he said the next thing that will happen is that we will grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ when we can grow to the level of love he said we will grow into christ in all things so we will become exactly like the head so it's possible for a believer to walk on earth exactly like jesus christ but they will first of all migrate from unity into the knowledge of the son of god into a perfect man which speaks of character into the fullness of the measure of the stature of christ which speaks of principles into an established place in doctrine not tossed to and fro or deceived by the craftiness of men into the place of love which is the nature and the motivation of god then he will grow into christ in all things this is the pursuit of every apostle and this is the body in the heart of every genuine minister to bring those who follow him not to become like him but to become like christ and if the apostolic move we get it right this must be our focus this must be our focus there's a place where your followers try to be like you you are inspiring them there's nothing wrong but they will have to grow beyond that place otherwise they'll become hypocrites and psychophants you know Paul said be a followers of me even as I'm the follower of Christ a point will come when you will find your place in Christ a point that point must come if that point does not come when Christ takes over his church then we will receive the church from Christ and that church will belong to the world perfection this is the goal this is the body in the heart of God when we see you what is the Christ dimension you carry from knowledge to power to love don't think when we talk about the dimension of Christ it stops only at the level of knowledge you can be at the level of knowledge where you can teach mysteries you can be at the level of knowledge where you know all things you can be at the level of knowledge where you can answer hard questions and hard sentences because there was no question they asked Christ that they didn't have answers for but you must also migrate from the level of knowledge to the level of power and then we must see a dimension of God in you either you are walking in healing dimension or you are walking in financial power or you are walking in influence and governmental authority but that's still not the end you must migrate into love and so in you we must find the attributes of patience of kindness of gentleness of faithfulness you must migrate to love before you can grow into him in all things but you see paul said all of these things will be impossible except as we understand the foundations foundational doctrine that is in christ jesus and the first of that doctrine paul called it repentance from dead works and we took our time to deal with that thoroughly last tuesday we said repentance is turning away from our errors in regret and lamentations and sorrows but not stopping at that level of sorrow but in that sorrow turning to god and having turned to god we receive forgiveness and then we move in the direction of god with a new mindset that empowers us not to go back to where we turn from that's what we call repentance so there's a turning away from there is a sorrow a godly sorrow and then there's a turning to christ having received forgiveness from christ there is a reprogramming of the mind changing of the mind and then there is a continuous walk in the direction of christ never to return to what we turn from we said if that is done then repentance has been achieved but we said in this context paul's emphasis is repentance from dead works and we said what are dead works we said dead works are 
works that are not inspired, empowered, or sustained by God. So there is no grace component in it. They are works that are orchestrated from the flesh to gratify the flesh. And so it does not glorify God, neither does it transform men. It's just about the show of flesh in manifestation. And we say you can do very spiritual things, but in the realm of God, they will be dead works. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it said, Having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace to serve God acceptably. So the only works that God accepts are the works sustained, powered by grace. Prayer can be dead works. Because you can be praying to, to prove a point. Jesus disdained the Pharisees for their pride and hypocrisy. And one of the places the pride of the Pharisee anchors is in prayer. He said they love to pray by street corners and to pray for long that they may be seen of men. He said they already have their reward. How can a man be doing something as spiritual as prayer yet God is irritated? Because his dead works is informed from flesh. Jesus spoke another parable. He said, Two men came to God to pray and ask for forgiveness. He said, One came to God and said, I thank you, Father, because I'm not like that fornicator. I keep my, my prayer time, I fast, I sow my seeds, and when he finished talking, in himself, he felt God was pleased. But God was irritated. He said the other man that this guy was accusing as not being holy, not living right, not giving his seed. He said that man could not as much as look to heaven. He wept on his face. And he said when they left there, which of them was forgiven? Which of them received answer? And Jesus said doubtless it was that other man that in the eyes of men was accused because he was not a superstar. So prayer, as spiritual as it is, can become useless and fruitless and have no reward with God. Preaching the word of God like I'm doing now can become very useless and irritating to God. Because it is possible for me to stand here and want to prove to my audience that I know the word of God. It is possible for me to stand here and want to prove to people that everything I'm preaching, I am, have attained it. I'm a righteous man and my self-righteousness and my pride in knowledge we so irritate God that if I'm not careful I will receive judgment for desecrating the altar with my pride as important as giving is giving can become dead works because you can give to make a show you can give to intimidate and undermine the one to whom you are giving. You can give in order to receive the goodwill of people. It's a show in the flesh. It's called dead works. If it is not inspired, powered, and sustained by the grace of God, God cannot receive it. Having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, he said, let us receive grace, whereby we serve God acceptably for our God. Is a consuming fire. And so Paul said the first thing we must know if we will grow to perfection is to know what dead works are and to turn away from dead works never to return to them. Never. So every day you must repent from dead works. You are stepping out, you dressed well and suddenly your pride anchored on your dressing. <laughs> Better ask God to help you quickly. As simple as it is, he can discredit everything you are doing. You can come to the altar and the first statement you made, everybody stood up and started clapping and somewhere in your heart, flesh rises. They never see anything. <laughs> I know what I'm telling you. It took revelation for God to start helping me on this matter. Sometimes you even come to a place, you say, you will show them something here. And then the first 10 minutes as you are talking, you carry them to a height where they've never been before. The goal is not to help them. The goal is not transformation. The goal is not transfiguration. It's just to show them that this minister that came now is in his own class. So they should be careful the way they relate with him. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost is looking at you. He said, what, did, what do you know that you were not taught? What have you seen that was not revealed? 
and then from that day your heavens lock and then when you finish talking there will be no results people will hear you they will not be transformed their lives will not change after a while they will say you are a good orator keep yourself where you are they are looking for answers to their existential matters dead works it's one of the plagues of our generation he said, if we must come to perfection, which is to become exactly like Christ, we must repent from dead works. The second thing Paul outlined, hmm, which I will talk about tonight, is faith towards God. Faith towards God. I taught you already, the moment you repent, the next direction is God. I've taught you a lot on faith but there are a few things I still want to emphasize tonight five basic things the first is the necessity of faith and you understand why Paul really really emphasize this truth when a man is delivered from dead works the next area of focus is faith towards God. Why is faith a must? I give you four reasons why. The chiefest of them, number one, is that there is no way known in scriptures that God can be pleased outside faith. So if you really want to do business with God, if you really want God to be pleased at what you are doing, if God's disposition matters to you, then you must walk the path of it. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, the Bible said, without faith, it's impossible. It's impossible. That means prayer doesn't please God. Fasting doesn't please God. Singing doesn't please God except as it is done in faith so every other thing we are doing must have their foundation on the bedrock of faith he said without faith it's impossible to please him he said for whoever cometh to him must first of all believe that he is and that is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him so the reason faith is necessary and faith is a must is because only by faith can God be pleased and I don't know what your ambition is as a Christian but if at the foundation of your ambition pleasing God is not there you don't know what Christianity is about when John went to heaven and he heard the 20 and 4 elders worshiping God the highest level of worship ever recorded in scripture apart from the of course, the surrendering service of Christ at Gethsemane. The highest worship ever done by creatures. We saw the summary of that worship. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, the Bible said they were worshiping. And what did they say? It said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. It said, For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they were created this is the scripture that summarized the purpose of all creation it said everything was created to give pleasure to god and so if you want to please god and fulfill the essence and the purpose of creation then faith must become your way of life so the reason faith is a must for every believer is because faith is the only way God can be pleased. Number two, why is faith a must? Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Why is faith a must? Number two, you cannot overcome in this world without faith. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, it said, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. It said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, 
even our faith. So our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's why the moment you got born again, God had to inject faith into your spirit. In Romans chapter 12 verse 3, the Bible says God dealt to every one of us the measure. It didn't say a measure. The measure of faith you require for a victorious life. Because if you don't have faith and if you don't operate by faith, sir, you're already a failure. Don't waste your time. The hope of overcoming is at the mercy of your faith. Have you seen people who pray and fail? Have you seen people who fast and fail? Have you seen people who give and fail because they don't know the place of faith? Anybody you see a champion on earth, go and check. He understands the language of faith. He understands the way of faith. He understands the spirit of faith. He understands the word of faith. That is the victory. Hear me. Without faith, you will fail no matter who you know. And I will show you in scripture. Jesus was with someone in Luke, I think chapter 8 verse 50. Here's what the Bible said. Luke 8 50. This is God standing with a man. They sent a message because he went to invite God. That's where prayer works. To come and answer a problem. A little one was sick. And God was on his way coming in majesty. And suddenly they sent a message. Trouble not the master. He said the young girl is dead. Immediately Jesus turned to her. To the man. He said fear not. Only believe. If you fear God will be here. Nothing will happen. Fear not. Only believe. If God helps you to overcome outside faith, knows that two things happen. Number one, his mercy. And number two, his sovereignty. Outside of faith, you are finished. Jesus looked at Peter. They saw him. They said it's a ghost. And he said, no, it's I. And Peter said, if it be thou, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. And Peter was coming. And suddenly the Bible said he turned back saw the wind and the wave boisterous and peter began to sink in, sink in the presence of god that means without faith the presence of god can't do much i know the glory of the presence of god but without faith the presence of god can't do much unless his mercy and his sovereignty goes to work and immediately jesus rushed to catch him because if jesus doesn't rush he will sink and he caught him and put him up he said why did you doubt my presence will be useless to you if you don't have faith have you seen brethren they pray they are feeling the anointing they are they carry the presence of god they can they know they you can cut it they are feeling it tangibly but they are defeated in life helplessly as though the whole prayer enterprise was useless it's because there was no faith at the foundation Faith is a must. Tell somebody, faith is a must. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. Number three. Why is faith so important? Is the key to answers. see these things i'm telling you take time to cross reference it with your life you will see why many issues in your life became outright dilemmas and you are wondering is god not there is god not real many have even turned to atheist attacking god saying god does not exist Reinhard bonke told a story a very humorous story but yet potent powerful and very explanatory somebody looked at him and said god does not exist and he said why do you say so he said if god exists why is there evil in the world because he went to a salon to cut his hair and he told the man babas don't exist and the man said of course babas exist here is one he said babas exist why are you bushy the existence of babas mean nothing until you subject yourself to their service So if the world does not comply to God's standard, the world will remain bad. So that something is going wrong, 
does not mean the answer is not there. You take the answer. And the way to take the answer is by faith. Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb. And they were weeping. John chapter 11. If you were here, our brother would not have died. If you were here. And Jesus told them something that was so powerful. I don't have to be here in person for your brother to be safe. I don't have to be here. You know what he told them? Have I not told you before? If thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. So anybody who believes doesn't need God to be physically present to have the answers he would have had if God were there. So when we walk by faith, it means we are carrying God into every circumstance. And because Jesus was on earth at the time, he did what they should have done if they had faith. He said, this glory you are about to see, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see it. So this glory does not only manifest when I'm around. These answers does not only come when I'm around. These answers are present anywhere, anytime there is faith. It is the key to answers. And many persons don't have answers and they are asking themselves why. The answer to your answerless prayer is lack of faith. The moment faith is born, answers will become byproducts. In fact, one of the proof that you have faith is that answers will come. It is natural for answers to respond to faith. And finally, why is faith a must? By God's wisdom, he prescribed faith as the way to live to everyone who is justified. The Bible said, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Romans 1 17. Hebrews 10 38. The just shall live by faith. If you say you are justified, then God has already prescribed the path that you will follow. If you don't walk by faith, you will fail. The only reason the impact of your justification will show is when you start living by faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it said we walk by faith, not by feelings, not by sensory perception. There are many believers who walk by feelings. Listen, feelings are good. They are the test boards of life. But you see, your existence must be superior to feelings. Otherwise, your life will fluctuate and vasculate in the direction of your feeling. Sometimes I see our brethren here praying and I'm just smiling. I'm just smiling because I know they are still growing. When they grow, they will understand prayer is not about what, what they feel. Prayer is not even about the excitement of the audience. When you see young believers praying, they are under pressure to have a feeling. So much pressure. And when that pressure becomes so much, they want to see the congregation excited. But the whole idea about prayer is to commune with God. Get God. When you get God, the byproduct from God is what the congregation is looking for. But you see, if you are not careful, instead of praying to God, you start praying to the congregation. Meleke, Meleke, come here. You need to ascend here. You need to... It's pressure. It's pressure. It's pressure. There are days when... See, I tell you, this thing is called speaking in tongues. It's not shouting in tongues. When the energy grows in you, you can shout. But you are, it's, it's a move of the spirit. And there are times when the energy will be calm. Even you know. And you will flow with the spirit. But when you are operating by feelings, you think every day it must be ilakabaga, ilakabaga. Ah, when you grow, you will know. You will know that this thing is about the move of the spirit. And the whole goal is to touch God. When you touch God, God will touch down. God will touch the people. And that's what makes the difference. Otherwise, a point will come when you will reprogram the mindset of the people. And you know the danger? They will be doing it thinking they are touching God. They are not. It's after five years, seven years, ten years. 
the frustrations of their lives will show them they never encountered or engaged God. Why do you think I'm very careful? Most times I pray alone and I saw that in Jesus' life. He will go to a separate place and he's praying. Because people are just watching you to do something so that they will copy. If I come here now and I start praying like this, after one month, all these young men will start Elakaba, Ragaba, Ragaba. And before you know it, it will become a trend. And because they follow me so closely, and there is an emotional connect between me and them, it will become a trend. And because I want my signature over a generation, I will push it and push it. But after 10 years, their frustration will show them that they wasted their time. I'm not against any disposition. I've told you before, but I persuade people, follow the move of the spirit. Follow the move. There are times when you'll come, it will be heavy on you. You'll just be weeping. You'll just be weeping. But the weight of glory will tell you, God is here. There are times when you will come, it will just be an interaction with God. You are just communicating. God is talking, you are talking. As you are praying, you are taking notes. It's, it's communication. And there are times you come, it's warfare. Because God is using you as his battle axe. When you are fighting in prayer, sometimes the energy will become fire. It will literally burn you. You can't stand. And there are times when that energy will be like a whirlwind. You will be running and sprinting. You will know that you are on the altar. You will lose all your comportment. You are operating by the move of the spirit. So don't put yourself under pressure. Nobody is calling you, sir. When you come and you are talking to God, talk to God. Talk to God. After a while, somebody will start breaking into laughter in the congregation. Somebody will start receiving revelation. Because as God is talking, the light will hit the audience. And that day is light they received. The day that it is battle, they will receive impartation. The day, so that's how these things work. At the foundation is the faith. Is the move of the spirit. And this is what God prescribed to the believer. In fact, for those who understand how prayer works, sometimes you are praying and you are entering different realms in one prayer. You started talking to God. After a while, you enter a realm of battle. And God teaches you some moves in the spirit. Ah. <laughs> some of the things we do, where do you think we learn them from? It's from the altar. You enter some place and it's a ground of warriors. You find some steps. Those readings, you, it's a move. It's a move. There, there, there are places where they fight backward. <laughs> I won't tell you some things. What? You think when we are dancing, we are dancing backward. We went somewhere, sir. We went somewhere. We saw some things. <laughs> ah, relax. Let's continue with Bible study. So, faith, and don't think of anybody in your heart. I'm teaching you, I'm teaching you as my disciples. Keep your heart open and learn. That's the corruption of this age. When you start talking, they start checking in their mind whether you are talking about somebody. Every minister has the law God gave him. And so they do it based on what God told them. There are some ministers that God told them, if you are praying, let everybody kneel down. That one is a definite consecration for that tribe. So they can kneel down and pray. It's what God told them. That's their shape in the spirit. There are ministries where you come. When they are praying, they are dancing. That's the law God gave them. There are ministries you go to when they are praying. They are carved. That's the law God gave them. But what we are teaching here is not the specific consecration of tribes. It's the general counsel of God. So keep your heart open and learn. And don't think what I'm not saying. <laughs> All right. It's difficult to teach in this church without words. Because what you are saying, people are hearing from everywhere. And they are making... Hallelujah! Holy 
आहे सो वाई इज फेथ ए मस्ट यू मे बी सीटेड नंबर वन विदाउट फेथ इज इम्पॉसिबल टू प्लीज गॉड वाई इज फेथ ए मस्ट नंबर टू फेथ इज द विक्ट्री दैट ओवर कॉम्स द वर्ल्ड वाई इज फेथ ए मस्ट नंबर थ्री faith is the key to answered prayers and why is faith a must because faith is the prescribed way of living that the holy ghost gives to us and so if you want to please god if you want to overcome your word if you want to have answers to prayers and if you want to live as the justified faith would be a must for you praise god now let's go into the subject matter proper Before I begin to define faith, let me show you four four things that faith is not. Four things. Number one, faith is not mental accent. What do I mean by that? It is not just mere believism. Just I believe this thing. I, no, that's not faith, because there are many people they believe in some historical facts or some doctrinal persuasions, but it is never followed with corresponding action. So you come to meet them Jesus heals the sick yeah of course Jesus heals the sick of course mentally it cognitively they they feel that's true but you will never see them put it to work when they are sick the first place they run to is a doctor the Jesus that heals the sick they will never talk to him because they have no expectation for healing and they don't believe Jesus will heal them meanwhile they 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 understand that doctrine all of that is mental it's not of the heart when you see a man who believe in a historical fact or a doctrinal persuasion but he doesn't follow it up with action that man doesn't have faith is a mental ascent it is mere believism jesus prospers but you will never see him trust god or learn how god prospers men and apply it yes the lord prospers but everything he's doing about his prosperity are the principles of business he learned from netherlands business school or lagos business school you will never see him put his faith to work for prosperity they say consecration is not there they say giving is not there they say covenant is not there but he believes more than anybody that god prospers he can even fight for that belief and he thinks he has faith there's no action and because there's no action all of that is dead it doesn't resonate with the frequency of it so faith is not mental ascent that's where many people get it wrong if you believe in god and in what he says the proof is not just what you say but the actions you take in line with what you have believed the second thing faith is not and i'm telling you why many people think they have faith but it's in the day of trouble they discover they don't have faith because they don't practice it they don't live it out they just agree with it in their mind and when trouble comes they now discover that they are divided in between they don't know whether to stand with god or to stand with men and so that division makes it impossible for them to receive from god he said let not a man that is tossed to and fro ever believe that he will receive anything from god he said a double minded man is unstable in all his ways so it's not a mental accent number 2 faith is not presumptions there are many people who assume or suppose that something is so but they don't have the fact that forms the basis of their conviction does god bless people yes how do you know uh, the bible says so where <laughs> what does the bible say he doesn't know and before you know he starts quoting parables so he just have assumptions and presumptions and presuppositions He has never examined them. Prayer works, of course. Prayer works. Really? How do you know? There is no basis for his conviction. He just picked things from all over the place. No coherent knowledge and understanding that is living by. But he has little, little knowledge about nuggets here and there, and he thinks that because he's aware of, he has faith. And so all his life, he's making assumptions. It is in the day of trouble where the requirement is based on acute understanding that he will discover he really doesn't know anything about anything. So many people when Kenneth Hagin was teaching faith, 
anything you claim he will ask you what scripture are you standing on you must be definite in your understanding if you tell Kenny Hagin that God heals the sick he will say what scripture are you standing on if you tell Kenny Hagin God prospers what scripture are you standing on because it's not there's no room for assumption in this matter because this is a matter of life and death imagine if you have headache and then you just go to the kiosk and say they say some drugs can cure headache pain reliever they say some drug are pain relievers and then you go and carry chloramphenico you 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 take you look at ampicillin you take you open the one in the bottle that should be injected in the vein <laughs> when you drink you will die that's what many people do they shuffle scriptures like a buffet they throw one here throw one they just gulp everything and because they have talked scripture they think there'll be answer god doesn't work like that there is specific knowledge for every answer you want so faith cannot be an assumption i'm telling you this because many christians they don't have definite understanding that forms convictions they are just religious people anywhere it leads we go there pastor say this week you will prosper hey man and they go and say god prospers man god even the message they are teaching that forms the basis for that impartation they don't receive it and you know when problem comes problems come to shuffle your mind and find out what exactly you know did god really say and then you now discover you don't really know what god said you have been living in assumption all the while and like if you will fall a thousand times you need to know exactly what god said so that even when you are dying dying faith you know this thing so much that you can't change your mind i was telling somebody the other day i know god heals the sick i'm not planning to die but if i'm on the sick bed now you can't make me change my conviction i have believed this thing too much to change my mind acute understanding i know god prospers sir i know this thing not because i have so much information but because i have precise scriptures that have formed my conviction that's why i can empty my account every week for six months i will not be perturbed those who live with me they know i don't depend on what i have saved i depend on god i'm not saying anything is wrong with saving but i know this thing so much that to empty myself is not a prayer point when the bible said those who come grieving with precious seeds shall doubtless return bringing in their sheaves i say some of us have grown past that level there is nothing precious that will carry to the altar grieving anymore there is nothing i will bring to the altar grieving anymore i have passed this sir because there's conviction there's conviction that's how faith works and it is born out of precise understanding see when somebody is talking i'm finding out what is the exact truth in it that's why you hear me sometimes trying to break these things down and explaining to you certain definites because too many things can be shuffled and juxtaposed in the reality and people don't know the exactness so when you come people are praying everybody is just praying when you come people are sitting i, I try to know why how and what specificity is something i don't joke with because that's where the answer is go for an interview and they ask you what is your name or they ask you where do you come from and say i'm african if you don't fail where do you come from mean they are tracing you to your local government they need to know exactly where you came from because they want to understand the character traits of the people from where you came from they can use this to assess you what do you mean africa <laughs> that's how the matters of faith works there must be exact knowledge number three what faith is not it's not natural believism many people think they have faith but all their trust and all their belief is in the realm of facts natural believism is a fact-based faith that is not faith if they don't see an evidence it's the thomas kind of faith unless i see him and i see the, oh, the the imprint on his palm i will not believe 
and the moment they see his hand and they see the signs of the nails my lord and my god that's how many operate even in the move of the spirit they come for service we, we are all growing sir and i can give you literal examples sometimes you go for a meeting god tells you this is a power service and i have seen it many times until god started teaching me faith the first time i traveled for a meeting for over seven hours i thought the meeting was for the next day so i would travel and rest when i came they said thank god the meeting is this night in fact we are late we are late i just drove for over six seven hours it was in kaba at the nyc camp and i didn't come on my own i came to represent a senior man of god and you are saying is now so give me 10 minutes let me pray as i knelt down to pray god say i will show my hand it says it will be a power service i stood up i said let's go i wore my suit i entered the meeting unfortunately as we were about to come out heavy wind began to blow and the downpour was heavy rain started falling ah and i understand a little bit about the the chemistry of of man when it becomes cold especially for a young minister it is difficult to charge the people up in fact everybody is coming to the meeting with a sweater <laughs> When I entered the meeting to make things worse, it was a new auditorium. So the whole windows were open. There's no covering. Air was blowing from one side to the other. On my microphone, you will hear because of air. I'm not exaggerating. God knows. Those who follow me earlier, you know, I've thought I've shared this story. Brothers and sisters, I thought and thought. I charged myself. I prayed in tongues. I will teach some things that I know we the hall we explode. Everybody was shaking like this. I was looking for somebody to fall down or for somebody to shout so that I'll be encouraged and start making declaration. Everybody sat like this. When I saw that things were not working, I left them and started worshiping. I worshiped. I worshiped. No word of knowledge was coming. After a while, God now showed me mercy. And I picked a word about a young man. I said he was wearing a glass, tall, full hair. He lost his father who was a pastor. And now he is struggling with his faith. In fact, he told himself that if he leaves NYC, he will go and do what he wants. I thought that was my key to break into the service. I gave the word with audacity because God cannot lie. We looked and looked and looked. The moment I gave the word, people started clapping. Looking for brother to come out. They look left, look right. Brother didn't come out. Service went from lukewarm to extremely cold and congealed. That was when I came back and said, Lord, mercy. Because I know one thing in God that will never fail. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Ah! Oh, do you know the worst part? God eventually broke out in the meeting. Many things happened. After the meeting, somebody walked up to me and said, uh, Pastor, I'm that uh, brother that you spoke about. I looked, I looked at him and said, Get out of this place. Get out of this place. <laughs> don't come close. <laughs> you don't know that my life was hanging on that word of knowledge. You sat where you <laughs> is that a begging? I said, Get out from this place. What I what do you want me to do for you? The anointing was on me when I was preaching, the anointing has lifted. <laughs> God started that was when God started constraining me, and I called him and prayed for him. And said, but what's the point? I was looking for a natural sign, and God wanted to teach me a lesson there was no sign until i became frustrated and i shouted and started giving commandment suddenly things began to boil
things began to boil and before i knew somebody shouted on the left somebody shouted on the right i now heard a plastic chair Bara! i say yes we are here when we hear that sound know that something <laughs> when you hear that sound you, you, you enter your warrior mood that was when i told them i came in the spirit of elijah <laughs> Zaka Tata, God told me He will show His hand. Oh yeah, 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 yeah! I came alive. But you see, God was teaching me: look for the sign of the Spirit, not the facts. The facts will lie. The facts can be manipulated. The God of this world controls the external; He can manipulate it. Keith Moore was teaching us two weeks ago and he said don't look at the natural you know why the bible calls the devil the god of this world that means he has authority to manipulate the natural you told yourself when you see a red vehicle it means god is in that meeting the devil will make sure every driver with red vehicle will not come because he controls the external you tell yourself if the person who wears white shirt and black trousers is the one i meet at the door it means something will happen everybody with white and black will go to the back of the auditorium that's why you don't look at the natural no he said why we look not at the things which are seen but at the things that are unseen he said for the things that are seen they are temporal but the things that are unseen they are eternal search the spirit search it that's where faith comes from search it in the spirit and sometimes what you will sense in the spirit is just a strand 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 Ayah. when that strand moves it can be the sign of an abundance of rain we are in the new testament god is no longer in heaven and we are reaching him god has entered us elijah may look for a hand's fist in the cloud he was in another dispensation in our own dispensation we look for the sign in our spirit they told you that job there are 500 candidates for the interview don't be perturbed check the spirit as you are praying you just sense peace you just sense a note of victory you just sense god say go forward sit there sit there heaven and earth will pass away that word will stand that's who you are that's who you are oh he mean he that's who you are oh he mean he That's who you are. That's who you are. There are times when God can give you an external sign. But the reason the external sign will be valid will be because there will first of all be an internal sign. If you miss that sign on the inside, what you are doing is not fit. It's natural believism. It's fact. Living by your senses and by your facts. Facts lie. Facts can be manipulated. And facts are under the influence of the God of this world. Sit down. We still have some 15 minutes. I need to run. The lasting faith is not a self-confidence many people are self-confident and charismatic and they assume that's fit because you are tall and broad on the chest and you have some very deep voice that's good <laughs> it's not you sir i know you are an elegant man boys <laughs> you come to a place with your suit and you say you know um i'll, I'll see what i can do about that it's good when you are doing your job for diplomatic relationship but if you are looking for the intervention of a spirit 
natural confidence is a limitation the moment you trust in yourself you have lost he said we have this glory in earthen vessel that the excellency might be of god and not of man many young ladies think they will be hot cakes in the market because they are tall and fair or because they are dark and they are elegant or because they have some kind of hairstyle and then suddenly when the race of marriage comes, they now discover it is favor many young men are intelligent they made first class undergraduate made first class masters made first class phd and they think when they enter the market everybody will be begging them they will now hold out those three certificates for 10 years 10 years and then you ask them they'll say i have a phd with first class no job you now discover that beyond that certificate there are other forces that manipulate that tide and then you see somebody else who made a tutu and i'm not saying go and make tutu those of you who are students <laughs> somebody who made tutu will suddenly become within the time when this one got phd that one will be an md of a company and he will it is manager that will be hiring people and the phd will be coming say give me the lowest rank available the race is not to be swift neither is the battle to the strong it is of god that showed mercy even ministry here there are many people who believe what do you mean we are gifted i can call people's names i can profile people by the prophetic anywhere i go to the least that we have is four thousand people well done and god will keep quiet some will look at you and say what do you mean i'm a man of prayer if we enter that territory we will uproot it we will uproot it give us three months god will be listening another one will come and say no utterance the utterance i have even kings can't resist me unless i don't carry a microphone if i talk in that land things will happen really then god will keep quiet they will now commission themselves into ministry and then they will be hoping that people the territory will be so privileged that they came there <laughs> they'll be hoping that the moment people hear that they are there everybody will gather they will now be there prophesying they will prophesy and prophesy and prophesy every three months church will reshuffle the 50 people that came when all of them receive prophecies they will now go new people will come after three years they will still be 52 that's when he will go back to god and kneel down and say the race is not to the swift the battle is not to the strong he said bread is not to men of skill it is god that showed mercy you will pray there and pray there the more you pray the more you will hide because after all the job of an intercessor is to hide so as you are praying you'll be hiding and then somebody else who doesn't have even half your stamina will enter that city and you'll become the star there in fact sometimes the way heaven will work the economy is that your prayer that ascends to heaven as virus and has stored in virus god will use it to push this other ministry because he is the boss of the company <laughs> you are in different departments <laughs> he said god resists the proud but he giveth more grace to the humble you want to do something with the spirit and you are standing on your physical strength your natural ability is an insult on god you despise his grace when you do that how dare you think your prayer is the reason why people will come how dare you think your prayer is the reason why what do you mean outside god do you think we are the only people who pray you think because you are gifted then you become a star and even god we have no choice but to celebrate you you are joking those who are wise the first thing they try to do is to turn away from their natural abilities paul said we are the circumcision that worship god in the spirit rejoicing in christ jesus having no confidence in the flesh the day you build your strength on your natural ability you have separated yourself from god and life will so buffet you it will so buffet you that if you even if you repent it may take mercy because you have despised the grace of god you have undermined 
the place of God in your life. No matter how gifted you are, submit yourself to God and he will exhort you in due time. Never allow the deception. You are going into that business, you say, I'm charismatic, I'm this. Be joking. You will go there and see the different perfumes that people wear to that business. Some, they carried it from the graveyard. Some come into those business grounds and they exchange people's stars through demonic order and astrology. And you will enter that market, somebody will be prospering by the favor of your life. Because you have come as a giant and as a superstar, God will leave you to manifest your ability. When you finish and you surrender, then he will come. Because the glory must be of God and not of man. I'm telling you, many people mistake charisma and self-confidence for faith. Because you can talk and when you talk, people clap. You are coming for a meeting, you think, no matter what happened, that meeting will be on fire. And he's not talking because he's trusting God for grace. He's not talking because he's praying for the present. He's talking because he knows he knows what to say. You will keep saying what is right, but your generation will never hear you. And then you will discover it's not the best interpreter of scripture that has the scepter of influence over a generation. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. Oh, him in the air. Oh, Pano Gang Mama. That's who you are. That's who you are. Have you learned something already? Now, what is faith? The word faith is the word pistis. And the word pistis simply means reposing your confidence and your trust in another. Waiting upon his intervention for your own victory. Putting your confidence and your trust in another. Waiting upon his intervention for your own victory. No wonder God instructed that we should walk by faith. It is designed in a way that flesh can never be glorified. It is designed in a way that only God can be glorified. And so when a man is walking by faith, his trust is in God. And his trust is in God's ability. So it is the intervention of God or they put in the ability of God to walk that engenders his own victory. A simple technology, but many have never come to accept it. You know the problem with many people? They feel God wastes time. Why would I be waiting on God when I know what to do? But they don't know that faith is not an act, it's a life. Because you may want to do something that you can do by your own ability. And then you decide that for now, I don't need faith. You will now come to a point where all your abilities put together can't do it. You will now start learning what you should be mastering. And then you discover it doesn't work. That's why many fail in the school of faith. They want to write a simple exam. They understand literature, so no need to trust God. Come on, what is literature? Then they write the exam of literature, but they go into the exam of life. Where they need successful living. They now discover that here, they don't have all it takes. That's when they now start learning to trust God. When they should be mastering trusting God. For faith to be faith, three things must be in place. Number one, there must be one in whom you trust or your trust is put. So you can't say you are walking by faith when you will not state clearly without contradiction whom your total confidence assurance and trust is in any man who is walking by faith can tell you without ambiguity that this is the source of all my answers and victory there must be one in whom your trust rests if that cannot be spelled out in your life you are not a man of faith number two for faith to be faith 
there must be a basis and for us who are Christians the basis of our faith are the promises of God the nature of God and the possibilities of God that he has assured us so when you find a man who is walking by faith he doesn't just come and that's why I showed you what faith is not talking and floating in limbo anything he tells you his assurance is either in God's character or in God's word the integrity of God's word or in the promises that God has made or in the possibilities that God has affirmed those bases are the foundations of his faith if I go to lay hands on the sick now I'm not doing it because I'm being creative I'm doing it because I believe in the integrity of the spoken word of Jesus that when I lay hands on the sick the sick shall recover and so when I'm going to lay hands on the sick if I am feeling powerful that is good but my feelings are not the basis of my action so whether I feel it or I don't feel it Jesus said lay hands on the sick so the basis for my action must be clear at all times the reason many don't get the faith results is because they are taking actions that are baseless when you speak with that audacity what is he anchoring on is there a word for it is there something you know about God's nature and I'm saying this the way I'm saying it so that you know this is not about quoting scriptures or memorizing scriptures if you remember scriptures that is good but what we are talking about here is beyond the way King James is written because many people feel it's not faith until it is thou shalt beholdest thou that's not what we are talking about we are talking about God's position on every subject matter and so if I know God's position I stand where God is standing and so I don't need to say if thou layest thy hands on the sick they shall recover no I can know it in pidgin English if I put my hand on top sick person in go recover it will produce the same result it's not King James it's God's position that's the basis many people are trying to quote King James to feel powerful but they are not standing where God is standing on the subject so even what they are saying they don't know it and they don't believe it so there must be a basis when you step out and you tell yourself I must prosper what is the basis is it because you went to a business school is it because they promised you a job is it because you have a rich father or because the Bible said Jesus rich as he was became poor that you may become rich the basis must be clearly defined because when battles come it is the basis that will be the contention because when the devil looks at you he's not even moved by the action He's trying to understand why you are doing what you are doing. And it must be very clear. If that becomes clear, there's no way your faith will not produce results. And then number three, what makes faith faith is that there must always be action. He said faith without works is dead. And so there are many persons who are trying to live the faith life, but there is no clear definition of whom their confidence rests on when they are making a decree they are making a statement part of that confidence is in their uncle who is a vice president or a senator when they are making a decree on another time part of their confidence is on their position on their job when they are making a statement part of their confidence is on the money somebody promised them and so you see that their lives are scattered every other thing that brings success to your life is a channel God is using and so a man of faith any day any time in whatever context he speaks his assurance is God I showed you from Psalm 23 verse 1 last on Sunday the psalmist said the Lord is my shepherd he had strong warriors he was a king he was he had he had experienced himself but there was no time he said anything listen every time you take action ask yourself am i saying this because of my savings am i saying this because of my position on my job am i saying this because of somebody who promised me am i saying this because of a friend am i saying this because a man of faith hundred over hundred every time he's talking or doing anything 
it is God and God only. He sees every other person, system or thing as a channel. There will never be a time when the place of God will be in contention. And a man of faith, for every action he takes, there's a basis for it. Either because of what he knows about the nature of God, or because of a promise he's standing on, or because of a revelation from the word of God. If you are there, you are safe. And finally, a man of faith will always cap all he does with corresponding action. He said, thou believest that there's only one God. James 2, 19. He said, thou doest well. He said, the devil also believes and trembles. He said, but O ye vain man, knowest not thou that faith without works is dead. And in verse 26, he said, for as the body without the spirit is dead. He said, also faith without works is dead. So even if you believe God, you stand on his word or his nature. If you don't have action, you are not in faith. These are the three things or the three triangle that completes the circuit of faith. Is this not simple? But when you walk through life, you discover it's hard. Because many times when we confront issues, we confront them because of what our friends promised us. Many times when we confront issues, we confront them because of where we are walking. Don't you know, sometimes the way we are excited when we are promoted in life is because we think our levels have changed. What you do in life doesn't change your level. The promotion you get on your job does not change your level. Your level is what God calls you part-time. You can get a promotion on your job if, you're, if what God calls you have not changed, you have not promoted because they may give you a physical promotion it can kill you so a mass level actually changes if his status with god changes you need to know this before you celebrate your promotion on your job and it becomes the demerit in your faith work before you celebrate your increased income and it becomes the demerit of your faith work before you celebrate your new relationships ah now i have the uh, the the phone number of the chief of army staff i know the president personally you will be shocked there are many things the president cannot do when the devil brings cancer the president will be helpless like every other person the only one who can answer all the crises of life is the one your faith stands on and so a man of faith every day in every circumstance has one confidant is god has one basis God's position which is either his nature or his word and we always act as a sign that he believes God and he believes the basis for his action if this cycle is complete you can tell yourself I am a man of faith now when you enter the faith life you will discover something that this is a life not an act and so you begin to grow in it from one level to another level and there are 10 levels you grow in faith. 10 levels for everybody who is in the faith life. Hope you know I quoted for you already. It said the just shall live by faith. It didn't say the just shall act faith from time to time. So when you enter the faith corridor, there are levels. And I will just list them because of our time as we close. The first level you will find yourself in, in the faith corridor. It's a level where the Bible calls no faith the level of no faith that's how the bible puts it in matthew mark chapter 4 verse 40 mark 4 40 mark 4 40 quickly mark when i'm sharing this now try to find where you are and at the end of the service come and whisper to me tell me i'm in level this but please don't be in level one jesus was in a boat with his disciples and he slept off and the wind came hitting on the boat turbulently and they tapped him master master carest not thou that we perish and he woke up and he was offended at them and he said unto them why are ye so fearful how is it that you have no faith you see that they were calling on god meaning they trust god because they believe god can save them but god woke up and told them you have no faith 
That means they believe in God, but they are growing. They are at the zero level of faith. And you will not understand this scripture until you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 20. He will tell you the meaning of no faith. Deuteronomy 32 verse 20. And he said unto them, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are very forward generation. Children in whom is no faith. So when the master says you have no faith, he's making a statement. Not because there is no faith there, but because you are a forward person. What does he mean? A forward person is somebody who is twisted in the mind. Somebody who is controversial in the mind. Somebody who is difficult to persuade. So there are many persons, when you begin the faith corridor, you will discover there's a lot of contention in your mind. You will not be easily persuaded by what you are hearing. You will argue everything and anything God said. That's where Thomas was. In, in John chapter 11, Jesus told him, Lazarus is asleep. And he said, ah, if Lazarus is asleep, he will wake up now. Why do we need to go there? Everything he kept arguing. Everything he must twist it. That's a forward mind. For such a person, it will be difficult to operate in faith. Even when Jesus resurrected, they said, the master is risen. He says, it's a lie. Unless I see his palms. I saw when they put nails there. I must dip my hand deep inside and see the hole before I believe. When Jesus showed up, he said, take. Have you not seen people who are so controversial? Everything you tell them, they will argue and argue. Not because they are doubting you, but they cannot bring themselves to just believe. The mind is so twisted, complex, conjugated, and complicated for such people. The Bible says they have no faith. A forward generation. Children in whom is no faith. The second level of faith is the level where the Bible calls little faith. Little faith is a bit similar to no faith. But the difference between little faith and no faith is not just that the mind is complicated. The mind is open. The mind is ready to learn and believe. But there's a challenge. The challenge is that there is fear and there is doubt. That same scripture, Mark 440, Jesus said, why are you fearful? Why does doubt arise in your heart? You see that? But in another verse, he now said what Jesus said. He no longer called it little faith. In Matthew 8, 26, he, called it, he no longer called it no faith. He now called it little faith. So as you are growing in faith, you will believe God so much you will be eager to take actions but every time you want to take action there will be a fear that wants to arrest your action that fear will want to arrest your action you know god says lay hands on the sick you are seeing the sick you are being pulled to lay hands but fear will paralyze you for those who have no faith the cure is to open their minds to learning when you find that your mind is twisted you must pay the price to buy the truth expose yourself to teachings find who speaks to you and sit with him to teach you until the mind opens for those who have little faith who are always taken over by fear get a mentor when he is acting go with him after a while you will overcome that fear when i was growing up i discovered a terrible phobia i can't stand before people even up till now it takes the anointing as I am talking to you now, if I step down from this platform and I'm talking to you, I can't look at you in the eyes. I will hardly talk to people and keep my eyes. I can't do it. If I'm walking out of this hall, even though I'm the pastor here, I won't be able to look at people as I'm walking out. I'll just look down and go where I'm going. That's how I am. It's the anointing that imparts boldness when I'm ministering. But you see, the reason, one of the reasons I was able to grow faster was because I had mentors. So when they are ministering, I'm watching. When they are going for a meeting, I travel and go to that meeting. Sometimes I'm privileged. They say, come with me. Sometimes they don't call me. I follow them. When I see the flyer, I'm there. After the meeting, well done, sir. 
How did you come here? I'm learning. I'm pursuing something and I must catch it. And so I'm seeing what they are doing. As I'm seeing it, faith is rising in my spirit. Faith is rising in my spirit. And then a point comes, you receive a baptism of what they are doing. And then you now discover when you are in that position, even before you think, the action has gone. You are preaching and before you know what's happening, you say, there are five people here, God is touching. You didn't know when you said it. But you followed until faith has risen in your heart. And as you declare, it happens. You look at somebody, they say there's a challenge. You say in the next seven days, there must be an answer. When you finish, you now ask yourself, did I say seven years? You now go home and start begging God. This thing better happens. Oh, what have I done to myself? It's because you received a baptism. Because little faith is a faith that is paralyzed by fear. That's where many are. Number three level of faith as you are growing is what we call weak faith. Weak faith is a faith that does not necessarily fear, but it's a faith that considers. So when you say do this, it's wondering, how about this? How about that? What of this? What will happen to this? So the mind is too logical. The mind is too calculative that the action cannot be taken because it's considering too many things. Remember the Bible said, Abraham considered not his body now dead, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. But there are many people who will consider their body. You tell them, you'll get married this year. And they say, Kai, but this is August too. When are we going to start dating? When will we understand ourselves? When are we going to do introduction? When is the marriage? Did you not read the Bible? It said, though the cloud will be empty, but the brook shall be filled with water. It's not about what you are seeing. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things that are unseen. You tell them by the Spirit, God said in seven days you will have a job. And they say, hmm. I've not worked for 10 years, so most of the job now, they will ask for experience and they are looking for young people. I'm now 48. Which one will I apply for? They are considering. That's why their faith is weak. If they were able to migrate from the realm of consideration, you will discover that their faith will produce results. But the mind cannot but go to work. Romans 14 from verse 1 to 2. He said, him that is weak in faith, receive ye. Paul was talking about those with weak faith. You know their problem, you will see it. He said, but not to, not to doubtful disputation. That means when you receive those who are weak in faith, don't fight with them, leave them. That's where they are. When you are talking, they say, relax. That can't work. When Elisha showed up and said, by this time tomorrow, a cup of barley shall be sold for one shekel. The prime minister stood up and said, sir, I know God too. In fact, I know God enough to know that there's a window in heaven. But even if this happened, rem be reminded that you are talking about national economy. For national economy to change, there must be budgetary issues, there must be strategies, there must be policies, there must be bureaucratic improvements. What do you think? Do you think you are talking to one widow? This is national economy. Consideration. They know too much for their faith to produce results. He said, when you receive those people, don't argue with them. It won't help them. He said, for one believe it, that he may eat all things, another who is weak, it helps. So they think it's wrong to do certain things because they have too many rules and regulations, too many facts, too many programs that has become a law in their mind. That's why their faith is weak. Every time God speaks, they begin to consider. Hope you know the reason Peter began to sink was because he started considering the wind and the wave. So faith becomes weak when consideration takes over the place of believing. That's the third level of faith. But don't be discouraged if you are there. You are still growing. You are still growing. You are growing from no faith to little faith to weak faith. See, what you do at this level is that go against your consideration when you think it will not work go and do the same thing the more you argue that's the more you act as you are acting you will discover that a point will come your results will begin to supersede your arguments and then the second thing you do at this level is to cast down your imaginations 
the bible says casting down imagination and every high standing thing second corinthians 10 from 3 to 5 and bringing into captivity so god tells you you will marry this year and then your mind is telling you not the devil that no nobody can meet somebody date somebody and marry in five months tell yourself my god does not live in the realm of time everything my god says happen i rebuke this thought what god says will happen if you don't talk to yourself and cast down those imaginations those imaginations will subdue your faith you will now discover that you have faith but never having result because your faith is weak so two ways to deal with weak faith is to keep carrying out the actions and number two keep casting down your imagination see the faith life is a deliberate life we grow in it it doesn't just happen we grow at one level no faith you receive light keep learning keep growing in understanding your mind is straightened you go to little faith at little faith get mentors learn from people until you are baptized then you come to weak faith start taking action you go there your mind is telling you Kai I know God can heal the lame but Kai this person leg this is not spinal cord problem oh, this leg is this leg is tiny Kai, the bones this is bones if it was a pain or a fracture maybe but Kai this leg the leg is even bent the power that heals the pain is the power that straightens the leg your job is not to consider how your job is to take the action it says as thou knoweth not how the bones are formed in him that is with child it says so knoweth not thou the ways of the spirit the harder it is the simpler it is for god it says for with man these things are difficult but with god all things are possible Have you not been there before somebody said my eyes are itching me you put your hand in the name of jesus eyes be healed the next person you meet is also i but the eyes are budged out with cancer you will now say where are the intercessors come 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 we need to join faith <laughs> where are the intercessors we need to you know what you are trying to escape you are trying to escape taking the blame if it doesn't happen they will say it's all of us we are still trusting god that means when you prayed for the one you thought was weak you took the glory the same power that healed itching can heal cancer it's not for you to consider yours is to lay hands and make decrees but you see if your brain keeps considering you'll be asking yourself when will this thing go down will it puncture will it vanish what will happen that is not your duty that is god's duty allow god to think how it will happen you follow what he has told you weak faith is a faith that considers number four dead faith dead faith dead faith is a faith that succumbs to arguments and doesn't take action so if you don't grow from weak faith you will descend into dead faith the bible said in james 2 19 and 26 faith without works is dead and so somebody is here i say i believe in healing he has never prayed for the sick he doesn't have faith i believe in prosperity he has never taken an action that god recommends for prosperity he has no faith every faith that is not dead takes action number five you now have what we call vain faith vain faith first corinthians 15 verse 14 vain faith there are many people who have vain faith and if christ be not risen then our preaching is vain and our faith is also vain what is vain faith vain faith is a baseless faith there is no basis paul is saying the faith we have has basis the reason we believe is because christ rose from the dead just in case christ did not rise from the dead and we are here professing eternal life he said that would have been a, a vain faith because he's baseless but because christ rose our faith is substantiated so a vain faith is a faith that is not substantiated either by a promise or by nature or by an action of god these are the five levels of weak an unproductive faith when you are able to grow from this level then you enter the faiths that produce result and the faith that produce results are also in five categories number one is steadfast faith 
steadfast. Colossians 2 verse 5. Steadfast faith. He said, for though I be, I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Join and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith. Steadfast faith is faith that endures. I know the answer has not come, but I still believe. You know, you must migrate from steadfastness because you have suffered no faith. You have suffered weak faith. You have suffered little faith. You have suffered dead faith. Now you are beginning to learn to take action. As you start taking action, don't assume you will see results. Results don't come immediately. Ask every faith practitioner, they will tell you. You say you are an intercessor. You go to pray for deliverance. You will pray and pray. Maybe the first 10 people you pray for, the demons will not go. The case will become worse, but you will endure. You are trusting God for breakthrough. The moment you start taking actions for breakthrough, that's when your finances will become tighter. If you don't come into steadfastness of faith, you will discover that you will drown. So the first level of productive faith is not faith that have answers. It's actually faith that refuses to back down. Even if the answer does not come, I will stand my ground. I rather die in faith. When you grow from steadfast faith, you now go to strong faith. Strong faith is a faith that rejoices in the midst of circumstances. You see that at this level, you have not started getting results. But you have believed faith more than your answer. Because when you start walking in faith, the first thing God will teach you is that your faith is superior to the answer. Your faith produces the answer. But even if the answer does not come, your faith must be alive. So even in that difficult circumstance, you see yourself rejoicing. When you can rejoice in the midst of circumstances, then you know that your faith is strong. The Bible said in Romans chapter 4, from verse 18 to 19 to 21, talking about Abraham. See what he said about Abraham. Abraham believed God. He was standing on God's promises. He was taking actions, but no result for 25 years. That's why the Bible said he had strong faith. He said, who against hope believe in hope? That he will become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So there is a basis. So shall thy seed be. And he said, be not weak in faith. See, why, see what he calls weak faith. He considered not. I told you weak faith considers. He said, be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Go to the next verse. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. But he was strong in faith. What did the strong faith do? It didn't produce answer. He was giving glory to God. Sarah is barren. I am impotent, but glory to God. The job has not come, but glory to God. I am not yet healed, but glory to God. I am not yet married, but glory to God. Many, instead of growing in faith, they start going backward. They move from, from enduring faith or steadfast faith, and they collide back to dead faith and goes back. The answer is not what informs the faith. It is the refuser to change your position. I told you, faith is not just an act, it's a life. Go and ask all the faith giants, they will tell you. You'll see Bishop Oedekwa today, they just give commandments like God's, and things happen. You think that's how they started. You see Pastor Chris, he shows up, he sees cripple, get up, out, and it's happening. You think that's how they started. There's something they call in Christ Embassy, Chronicles of Healing. You will see how healing school, only one sick person will come, one. And Pastor Chris will show up with suit. He will lay hands. He will tell everybody, stretch hands. They will pray. When they pray, he will lay hands. Hands will walk. He will lay his leg on their legs. He will sit there. They will carry up. He will throw power. They will do a lot of drama on one person. And after battling and battling and battling, the person will be healed. The whole church will cheer and celebrate. One person. Imagine you come for healing school, only one person is lying on the altar. And God's servant comes with suit. And then today, when he's coming to healing school, he doesn't spend up to 10 seconds with one person. 
whether it is cancer or broken bone or hepatitis or HIV out 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 the reason is because that faith has been schooled that faith has gone through process that faith has understood what it means to celebrate when there is no answer most of us here we only celebrate God when there is answer the moment answer comes we are dancing shaking our body lying on the ground and if answer does not come everything is gloomy well I don't know uh, they said God answers prayer so we are here that's not faith you know how to intimidate the devil celebrate more when there's no answer the devil will now discover that it is not answer that is your persuasion it is your conviction in God that is your persuasion when you are there it's called strong faith number eight we have what we call unfeigned faith you will see that all of these things are processes unfeigned faith is a sincere kind of faith truthful kind of faith honest kind of faith in second timothy 1 5 and first timothy 1 5 T paul was commending the faith of timothy which was in his parents and he called it unfeigned faith he said when i call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that was in thee which dwelt first in thy grandmother lois and in thy mother eunice i was persuaded is also in thee do you know what happens to many people and they never grow in faith again he comes he feels or he perceives that god says there's somebody on the second row who is blind he now says there's somebody on this second row who is blind and nobody answers that is blind he will now say no no what the second row i mean is in the spirit there's no sincerity you know what he has done he has aborted the faith program he comes and makes a declaration next week 10 people will prosper next week comes there's no testimony of prosperity he now comes and say a day in the eyes of god is a thousand years when i said next week don't assume that it's seven days you are carnal you are not spiritual you don't know spiritual things when you understand spiritual permutation and algorithm you will know that these things i said oh god relax relax be sincere if it doesn't work maybe i missed god i'm still learning don't put yourself under any pressure stay truthful the moment you pass the test of unfeigned faith you now enter into faith that produces result because the next in faith will become great faith what is great faith great faith is faith that produces results great faith is faith that breaks protocols great faith is faith that creates answers even where there's no answer so god will school you in the school of faith before he brings you here luke chapter 7 from verse 1 to 9 you hear the story of the centurion came to jesus and said the servant was sick and jesus the people persuaded him this man is a great man he has done well for the church and jesus said okay if he has i will go you know many people think god doesn't pay attention to those things the reason jesus followed this man they said he has helped the church he has even built a synagogue today people tell you forget all those giving they say like it's not true god pays attention to it they told him this man built a synagogue he is a good man and jesus said i will go there as jesus was on his way coming he said stop don't trouble the master he doesn't have to enter my house he said i am a man under authority i said to one go he goes i said to another comes he comes send the word only my servant shall be made whole and in verse 9 jesus turned and marveled people surprise god there are men who surprise god and jesus marveled and said i have not seen such great faith no not in israel immediately the answer was produced three things to learn there is number one great faith produces results number two great faith breaks protocols you know why this man was a gentile jesus himself said i am not sent to the gentiles i'm sent only to the household of israel but the man broke protocols and number three about great faith is that great faith answers anywhere anytime it doesn't have to be where you are anywhere anytime 
great faith has the capacity to produce results. This is how God grows us on the corridor of faith. If you study Matthew 15, from verse 21 to 28, you hear the story of the Canaanite woman. She was pleading with Jesus. My daughter is vexed with demons. And Jesus said, no, I didn't come to the Gentiles. I came for the household of Israel. The dispensation of the Gentiles will begin when the Holy Ghost comes. But now, I'm only for the household of Israel. And the woman said, no. And Jesus turned to her. In fact, the disciples became offended. Ah, Oga, heal this woman's daughter. Now, if you don't want, let her go. And Jesus looked at her and said, it is not good to give the children's bread to dogs. You would think the woman would be offended. Am I a dog? Jesus will not insult anybody. She understood the parable. But she answered from a superior realm. She said, even the crumbs that falls from the table, the dogs can eat of them. And Jesus turned and looked at her and said, wow, woman, great is thy faith. Go, thy daughter is made well. Three things again. Number one, it produced result. Number two, the woman was not a Jew. She's a Gentile. And number three, it answered, even though Jesus was not there. That's how great faith works. But it's a journey. Most of us think the moment we, we say we have faith, we will start producing result. No, it's a process. The day you receive faith, maybe you are operating at the level of forwardness. Your mind is too complicated for power to flow. And then you move to the level of fear, little faith. And then you move to the level of dead faith, no action. You will keep growing like that. So don't be discouraged that you are not seeing result. It doesn't mean there is no result in what you are doing. You are just growing. A day will come when you will move into the realms of great faith. And anything you say, even if you don't mean it, it will still produce result. When you have mastered great faith, then you now have rich faith. Rich faith is when you become heavy with God. You have stature with God. Because as you grow in faith, a point will come you will discover that it's not about the results. It's not about the manifestation. It's about glorifying God. So everything you do, your motivation will be for God to be glorified. When you get there, you are not just rich, great in faith anymore. You become rich in faith. James 2 verse 5 and 6. Hear what the Bible says. It says, Hacking, my beloved brethren, had not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him. You know what was happening in this church? When wealthy men come to church, they give them seats in the front. And the brothers who are doing everything to glorify God, they relegate them to the back. And so he was teaching them. He said, no, those who are actually rich in faith, are the ones that live for God and do everything they have for God. So when a man becomes rich in faith, the greatest motivation of his life is for God to take the glory. If he raises the dead, it's for God to take the, glo God to take the glory. If he gives anything, it's for God to take the glory. It's a state of total yieldedness, submission and purity in your action with God. This is what Jesus and Paul through the Holy Spirit was teaching us. He said, for us to come into perfection, we must have gone through the school of faith. And when you come to the zenith of the school of faith, it's not manifestation. It's giving glory to God. Manifestation is the penultimate stage to the zenith of faith. There's a level where manifestation counts. But when you truly become a man of faith, your life becomes about glorifying God. And that's why Galatians 5, 6 says, Faith walketh by love. Are you seeing how these things work? All of these things are designed to bring you and I into perfection in our walk with Jesus. Ah, ah, ah. Hallelujah. Elohim Adonai Elohim Adonai You are listening to me tonight You put your faith to work You gave some money And you didn't have result as it were Don't be discouraged Faith is a journey. You prayed for the sick. You didn't have answers. Don't be discouraged. It doesn't mean you are not called. 
faith is a journey just keep growing keep growing one day you will break into the realm of great faith answers will become too common it's a journey refuse to be discouraged in the journey of faith you don't go back the bible said we are not of them that draw back onto perdition he said but we continue to the saving of the soul there's somebody here you have given for five years you have given for 10 years you have not even received one blessing from giving you are almost thinking this doctrine is a scam no it's not so there's somebody here you have prayed for the sick for seven years you have not as much as seen two healings don't think it's a scam it's real you are just growing a day will come you will become God's signature for a particular dimension rise up let's pray oh. Elohim Adonai Elohim Adonai I didn't have time I didn't want to go into testimonies because if I enter testimonies things would have erupted and I wouldn't have been able to teach but these things I'm teaching you I've seen them and they have become too common that as a principle now I hardly teach and refer to testimonies in the past because I saw the life of Jesus Jesus hardly will come for a meeting and tell you last week this happened no it will happen now because now faith is now I wouldn't have time to start talking about testimonies because if we pray now somebody will be healed as I'm standing now if I decree that you are blessed before tomorrow evening somebody's life will change it's not because i'm special i have learned faith and this is not that you are an apostle this is a calling of every believer it said the just shall live by faith if i want god to touch people here either do an activation or an impartation it won't take me one minute it won't take me one minute i can change this service now in one minute i can switch into god's power not because i'm feeling anything there is too much faith i know if i talk angels walk and it's not because i'm a preacher that's the calling of every believer master these things master them master it this is the secret of an invincible living i want to pray for you I didn't have time to talk about the enemies of faith but I give you four number one is fear that's why many times you want to do something fear rises in your heart it's a mirage number two is unbelief number three is lack of love it's a faith walked by love and unbelief the Bible says if you pray your heart believe that you have received and you shall have and then number four is sin these are enemies of faith if you can remedy them in your life your life will become a wonder can I pray for you now let me sing this song I'm here there's a song that was in my spirit when I was coming but we entered another realm so I, the song became an it became an error to sing it <laughs> Ibu Alpha na Omega mo, Onye ibu no ni bazo, Walimwele tu, Yakamji na si Ibu Chi, Idi Ibu Be, Idi Omi Mi, Oh, Ibu Alpha na Omega mo. Bazo, 
toward heaven the spirit of death hear this the spirit of death is trailing someone here and it has come with an assignment for your family as I'm talking now ah it's somewhere around here towards my right going to the back there you have been having visions and dreams of death, death, death. And this program has played out in your family about seven years ago. And the devil is coming back with that algorithm. We want to resist death. Can you lift your hands toward heaven? Just be calm. You don't need to do anything. Father, I ask that your hand will come upon that one that has been marked for death. And your word said you sent your word to Jacob and it lightened upon Israel. That one marked for death. In this auditorium now and even those watching online, I command that spirit to go back. I bind that spirit of death. I command you go back Amen. in the name of Jesus Amen. just lift your hands let life envelop you now life it will come like the rivers of joy from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet from that spot on the right and everyone here that things are dying in their hands Ushers, help me bring that person quickly that the hand of God is coming upon now. Take that grace. Hmm. The fires of life. The fires of life. The fires of life. The fires. The fires. Ibuchuku idima. Ibuchuku onye dike. Ibu alfa na omega mo. Bring that person here quick. 